In the previous lecture, we discussed Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism and a total of four equations exist. Now, one of these equations is known as the general form of Ampere's law. And this equation will be the premise of this lecture. So we're going to derive the general form of Ampere's law. So, let's begin by recalling what the actual equation states. So, the general form of Ampere's law looks as follows. So, if we take the closed integral of the dot product of the magnetic field B and our infinitely small vector given by DL, that will equal term number 1 plus term number two. Now, as we'll see in just a moment, term number one comes from the electric current that is moving through some region of space, and term number two comes from the changing electric field that exists within that region of space. So let's begin the following derivation of this general form of Ampere's law by supposing that we have a closed electric circuit and inside that closed electric circuit we have a parallel plate capacitor. So, let's draw the diagram of our parallel plate capacitor within our closed electric circuit as shown in the following diagram. So, we're only looking at the section of our circuit that contains our parallel plate capacitor. So, let's suppose this capacitor has a capacitance given by C. And let's suppose this plate has a negative charge and this plate has as a positive charge. That implies that the electric field will begin on the positive end and will end on the negative end of our capacitor as shown by these purple electric field lines. And because we have a negative plate and a positive plate, an electric current known as the conduction current will flow through our wires as shown by the following orange arrows. So these arrows symbolize the direction of our conducting or conduction electric current. So, let's begin by choosing our three-dimensional region of space as shown by the following green region. So, let's call this surface that is outlined by closed path 1 as surface 1. And the rest of our region is known as surface number 2. Now, let's suppose this closed region is known as closed pathway number 2. These two closed pathways will become important in just a moment. So let's begin by examining our electric current I that is traveling through the wire that is traveling through surface number one. So let's imagine that our electric current is traveling through this surface number one. What exactly is our magnetic field? Well, recall that any electric current that is traveling through a wire will produce a magnetic field around that wire that will form concentric circles. So, as the current, which is known as the conduction current, travels through surface number one along the wire, it produces a magnetic field. And this is given by the following term, term number one, where I is known as our conduction current. Now, however, even though no conduction current travels between the plates, between plate number one and plate number two, a magnetic field along the second closed pathway is produced as a result of the changing electric field. So, in our first step, we essentially discussed closed pathway number one. Now, let's examine the magnetic field that is produced along closed pathway number two, which exists between the two plates of our parallel plate capacitor. So, that is shown in the following diagram. 
So, this is plate number one. It has a quantity of electric charge given by, let's suppose, negative Q. And this plate, at that same moment in time, has a charge given by positive Q. And because we have a separation of electric charge, an electric field exists between the plates that will begin on the positive end and will end on the negative end. So, as time progresses, the quantity of charge on the plates changes. It can either increase or decrease. Now, because the charge stored on either one of the plates determines the electric field, we see that the electric field also changes as the quantity of charge on either one of these two plates changes. So even though there is no conduction current traveling between the two plates, because we have a changing electric field, that changing electric field will create a magnetic field and that is given by the following term. So this term comes from the less general form of Ampere's law that we spoke about in a previous lecture. Now, let's actually derive the following term. So, we know that the quantity of charge on either one of these plates of our parallel plate capacitor is given by the following equation. Q, the quantity of charge, is equal to C, the capacitance, multiplied by V, the voltage that exists between these two plates. Now, since we're talking about a parallel plate capacitor, we know the, par the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is equal to epsilon naught multiplied by A divided by D, the distance between these two plates. And we know that the voltage across a parallel plate capacitor is equal to the product of the electric field and the distance between the two plates. So multiplying these two, we see our D, the distance between the plates, appears on top and bottom. So we can cancel these Ds out and we get the following result. So, the quantity of charge on either one of these plates is equal to epsilon naught multiplied by A, the area of either one of these plates multiplied by E, the electric field that exists between our two plates. Now, because we're saying that our quantity of charge varies, changes with respect to time, and our electric field also changes with respect to time, we can take the derivative of this side and this side with respect to time. And we get the following equation. So, dq divided by dt is equal to epsilon naught multiplied by a dE divided by dt. So, notice that in this term, in term number two, instead of having an electric field, we have the electric flux. So, we know that electric flux is equal to the electric field multiplied by a. So, if we take this equation, rearrange and solve for the electric field, we see the electric field is equal to the electric flux divided by the area A. So let's take this and plug it into this equation so we see that the area will appear on top and bottom. We can cancel the areas out and dq divided by dt is equal to epsilon naught, the a's cancel, multiplied by d phi e divided by dt, where phi e is our electric flux. So recall that by definition of our instantaneous electric current, our instantaneous electric current is equal to dq divided by dt. So this is equal to I, which is equal to the product of the derivative of our electric flux and our epsilon naught. 
Now, this electric current that exists between these two plates is known as the displacement current. Now, notice, even though there is no actual current that exists between these two plates, we can think of this term existing as a result of this uh, hypothetical displacement current. So we see that the closed integral of the dot product of our magnetic field B and our infinitely small vector dl is equal to mu naught multiplied by the conduction current plus mu naught multiplied by our displacement current. Where this term comes as a result of the electric current traveling through the wire which is an actual electric current and this term comes from the hypothetical displacement current that is traveling between our two plates and we see that ID is equal to the following so we see mu naught multiplied by I where IC is replaced with I plus mu naught multiplied by epsilon naught multiplied by the derivative of our electric flux with respect to time and this is exactly the same as this equation and this is known as the general form of Ampere's law so we were able to derive the general form of Ampere's law from the less general Ampere's law that we spoke about in a previous lecture. And this equation tells us that our magnetic field is produced as a result of an electric current known as the conduction current and it's also produced as a result of a changing electric field. 